Welcome to the home meat cutting series and the taxidermy tips for birds, fish, and game mount video, Process Like a Pro. You will find that by using proper techniques, it will assure you a better trophy on your wall, plus the satisfaction knowing that it was done right. Today, award-winning taxidermist Greg Cole and Bill Cook will be taking you through step-by-step -step instructions. So here's Greg to get you started. Hi, my name is Greg Cole. I'm from Reno, Nevada. I'm an award-winning taxidermist, been practicing taxidermy for over 20 years. Today, I'm going to give you the most important tips on how to care for your trophy in the field that will result in the best possible mount to put on your wall. Okay, this is a chucker partridge from Nevada. Probably one of the most sought after game birds in Nevada. I'm going to show you a few tips on how to take care of this in the field so you can get it to your taxidermist in good shape. The first thing you do is when you get one on the ground, you want to inspect it a little bit. Look at your primaries here, your secondaries here. Make sure there hasn't been a lot of shot that's passed through there. This one's broken a little bit. It's not bad. This bird would be a fine specimen for an open wing mount. Uh, you want to just check it out. Look at its tail. Make sure it's got all your tail feathers on there. Make sure they're not shot or broken. Check for Young birds will have pen feathers in here. This one's fine. This one was shot in the middle of January. Our season goes until the 31st of January. And usually from January on, the birds are in really good shape. So you want to make sure that the bird's a fairly mature bird. It'll make a better mount. Um, by wiping the blood off, and then you go ahead and free, freeze them. They want to have a tendency to kind of stay that way. Like when you wake up in the morning, your hair's sticking straight out, you know. Um, so you're better off to try to keep the bird as dry as possible. Just clean the blood spots. This one apparently has no blood. This blood right here is, is irrelevant. I mean, it's not that bad at all. If you have one that's bleeding a lot and you have a lot of blood, try to wipe it off as much as possible. But if the bird is damaged to the point where it's just bleeding continuously, probably not a good specimen. Also... When you decide you want to have one mounted, you don't want to ever, ever gut it. You want to leave it in the hole. You want to give it to your tax numbers in the hole. You cannot have a bird mounted and eat it. You, got, you either have to make up your mind. You want to eat, eat it or you want to have it mounted. Um, you can eat one that's a little more shot up that's not as prime specimen. Uh, and also, like a large waterfowl, when you get a large waterfowl down, sometimes you shoot them, they're kind of broken up because you're shooting that heavy shot. Uh, if the wings, like I said, are broken, the legs are broken, uh, the, the taxidermist, the good taxidermist, should be able to take care of it. There shouldn't be any problem with that at all. Um, as far as um, the blood, the amount of blood on it, uh, waterfowl feathers are pretty much water resistant so the blood won't saturate it too bad either. You know, they'll just beat off it like the water does. So if you get a bloody bird, as long as he's in good condition as far as the waterfowl is concerned, you should be fine. And like I said, take it to your tax numbers, and they'll usually give you the right advice, whether it's a mature bird to have it mounted, or it's a young bird, first-year bird, where you have a lot of discoloration, you don't have the right color. This bird happens to be a, probably a two- or three-year-old bird. Um, he's got all his color. He's in fine shape. You know, um, this one here has a broken leg. Broken legs can be fixed. Broken wings can be fixed by the taxidermist. Uh, once in a while, you'll get a sh BB shot through the beak. That can be repaired if it's not damaged too much. Okay, the first thing I would do is I would take a cotton ball, put it into the throat cavity, keep any blood from draining out. Every now and then you'll get blood coming out of the nostrils. You can just wipe it clean, which would be fine. And then, like if it was a broken wing, let's say, I would take a little gauze pad, or you can even use cotton. Wherever the spot was, I would push it in there, just to absorb some of the blood. Because the less you have to wash these birds, the better off you'll be, and you'll have a lot better mount. And just get it kind of nice and tucked in. 
And then we'll take a nylon stocking, just a woman's nylon stocking, gather it up to where we got the toe here, slip the head in. I usually slip the head in first. A lot of people will take it and stick it underneath the wing, but if you do that, sometimes you'll have these feathers bend on you a little bit and they'll break. You're better off just to stick it in like this. Make sure the nylon stretches out pretty good. There you go. You want to be careful not to stretch the nylon out too far because it'll have a tendency to spring back and it'll rough your feathers up a little bit. Then what you can do is, if you're hunting in, say, December or January, there's really no hurry to get it back to your truck. So this way, you can either tie it in a knot, put it in your game bag, and you can hunt the rest of the day until you maybe lucky enough to get a limit. Um, this process will work fine with any bird. Um, like when you get into the larger birds, like geese and stuff like that, it might get a little tough to find a nylon for it. But any upland game bird will be fine, ducks, you know, quail, so on and so forth, they'll be excellent. But if you happen to get a couple pheasants or so, make sure if you're going to tie the end of it, don't tie your tail into it, because then you'll have a kink in your tail and they're kind of a, kind of a pain to get out. But this way is probably one of the, the best way to get it to your taxidermist. Then once you get it from your, your field into your freezer, what I would do is get a heavy duty plastic bag, uh, anything, you can buy at the store, trash bag or anything. I use these meat bags. Slip it in there. I try to get as much air out as I can. Just fold it up real nice. Be careful here where your tail and your feet are. You don't crunch it. Just fold it over real nice. Try to get as much air out as possible. Just tape it closed. Go ahead and just put it into your freezer and get it to your tax term as soon as possible. It'll stay good like this for probably, oh, eight to nine months. Uh, there's another way you can seal these things also I use in the studio, are these seal meals. These are probably the finest way to keep these birds preserved because this takes, draws all the moisture out of them and they are good for one or two years. A lot of tax members will use this technique, it's probably the best way to do it. Okay, here's a few tips on how to care for your trophy when you determine it's a trophy. In the field, right preparations, where to cut on the animal to take it off the carcass so you can get it to your taxidermist. First thing you should do is determine whether you're going to have life-size mount, lying or standing. And this is this is a mannequin of a red fox yawning, um, but this were, will pertain to any animal, any four-legged animal that you're going to collect in the, in the field. Um, so the best thing to do, if you decide you want your animal standing upright like this, okay, or not in this exact position, but in an upright stance, which I would prefer being a taxidermist, is a dorsal mount. And especially on short haired animals like your sheep, uh, some of your deer, your antlered animals, your horned animals, you don't need to make the long cuts up the back of the legs and the front of the legs so you can hide your stitching a lot better so you don't see your stitching after the final mount. So what I would do would be a dorsal cut, what we call a dorsal cut. And what we do is we start from the base of the skull even if this had horns, you could still do it this way. From the base of the skull, and you want to cut right down the back, like so, to about two to three inches from your base of your tail. Then we can just skin it down this way. You just skin it this way, and then you'll run into difficulties because the skin will only go so far. 
And then what I would like to do is I would like to sever the head off right here at the last vertebrae, the base of the skull. This will drop loose. You'll have this all free to skin. And then when you get your hide, say down past the knees, right here, or past the hocks back here, what I would do is I would turn it. Of course, it'll probably be on its side anyways. Then I would cut right through, say this is your hoof area or your pad area. I would, if it was a pad area, I would start right behind the pad, come right up the center of the leg to no further than the knee. Both ways. Now, if there's a hoofed animal, you would do the exact same thing. Right where your dew claw, your dew claws, excuse me, will be up here, but come right to where your hooves meet and cut through your dew claws, which the anatomy is a little differently on an antlered animal. I would only come up to the first joint, which is right here. Same thing on the back. See if this is your pad. Behind the pad, cut right to here. And if this is your hoof, say this is your hoof, cut right to here. So you have an opening from here to here. You have no cutting here. And you'd have an opening from here to here with no cutting up through here. But this procedure or this method of cutting the animal will only work on a standing mount. It will not work on a lying down mount because you have all your legs tucked up underneath here and it's virtually impossible to try to get everything slid in position where you need it. So then what I would recommend would just do the regular belly cut which basically this form shows about exactly where you need it. And now these are only for lying down mounts that I would recommend this because oh it's a lot easier on the tax numbers. But if you're not sure how you want it mounted, you're better off to go with a belly mount, a belly cut, excuse me, because if you do a dorsal cut, you're going to be limited to what your position of mounting this. You may only get a standing mount on it. If you decide you want a lying down mount, you're going to need to sew that back up and cut through here, which your cuts will be continuous all the way to here, across the chest, back down here, across the chest. From underneath the chin here, which let's say it's a deer, a de actually if, if it was a deer, no let's not say if it was a deer, if it was a deer I wouldn't go any further from the, than the chest right here, but let's say it's a, a bear. I would come from underneath the chin, cut like this, go across the cut you made here, And you never want to go through the middle of your reproduction organs. You always want to go off to one side or the other. End up right to the vent. That will be your belly cut. On, let's say, fur-bearing animals. Then we go down here. Continue your cut from here down to here. Just follow the back of the leg because that's where your most hair is. And you have a little, you can look down most legs and you'll see a pattern where you can cut through it and you don't have to worry about cutting hair. Just go right through the pattern. Come down to this one here. Same with this leg. When you, you start your cut from underneath your chin, continue down the throat to the chest area, right down the center of the belly, go past reproductive organs. off to one side or the other. You never want to go through the middle. Continue down to the vent. Then you take your incision from back of the pad or the hoof and continue down the back of the leg and you can notice there'll be a hair pattern on a lot of animals that you can follow. You don't want to get off to one side or the other because it's just hard on the taxidermist. It gives you a lousy seam and you'll start cutting bad hair that you need to cut out to, to fix later. But you just want to go right down the back of the leg and you'll see a pattern, a natural pattern in the hair, the way it lies. Go all the way down to the vent to this cut here. Don't go through the vent, 
Just go right to it. Now, these cuts are all good for fur-bearing animals or antlered animals. If you're going to have a lying down mount. Furthermore, if this was an antlered animal, you would not only make these cuts, but let's say here where your horns, or your antlers, excuse me, you would make a Y from the base of the burr on the antler to about the, the point of the skull where it connects the last vertebrae connects from the head to the skull, okay? And then you'd have to make the cut to about the middle of the shoulders and stop it. That way you can pull it off the antler. The antlers, you can, you can get the hide past the antlers. But on fox, bear, lion, so on and so forth, you don't need to. You can just do your belly incisions like I showed you. That would be fine for a lying down mount. Now, if you decide you want a standing mount, an upright standing mount, just doesn't really show it too accurate, but if you want an upright standing mount, then you do the dorsal cut. And if it's an antlered animal, you don't have to worry, just continue all the way down, and you can skin it off this way. And then where I showed you, right here on the dorsal cuts. So that's the only incisions you make from here to here, from here to here. All this area will not have an incision on it, and you won't need to stitch it and it'll give you a lot nicer mount for a standing or an upright mount. I would like to touch on a few do's and don'ts when you're preparing your animal for mounting. Um, when you get the hide completely off the carcass, you want to make sure that a lot of people will tell you, go ahead and salt it. Uh, that's fine, but you want to make sure all your flesh is off the animal, all your fat is off the animal, off the hide, and that you have your lips turned, your ears turned, your nose split, your lips also split, excuse me, um, and your hooves, or if you have paws, have all the last knuckle joints taken out before you salt it. The salting is, is the correct way to prepare a hide, but you can run into problems if you don't have all the things I just mentioned done. Like say uh, you skin an animal off, you get it completely off the animal, you have it lying there, the, the ears are all intact, your lips aren't split, your eyes aren't split, and the first thing you're going to want to do is rub salt in it, which is, which is fine, but what's going to happen if you rub salt in it, if you can't get it to your taxidermist within say a 48 hour period, that salt will start the drying process on that and then the taxidermists are going to run into a few problems like say you keep the hide for a week, week and a half or whatever you think before you can get back to the taxidermists or back to the house. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to start, start the drying process and then you'll make it more difficult for your taxidermists to finish the hide out because your hides will be hard. They'll be basically dried up. You won't be able to get to the lips you won't be able to get to the nose or turn the lip, the ears, excuse me, inside out. Um, so some of that process that you've seen in other videos and so on and so forth, I would make sure if you're to take the animal off and you're not to do the lips, the ears, or the eyes or nose, I would treat the hide like the carcass, like if you were going to eat it. I would just get it cooled down as, po as, as quick as possible I would, they say not to roll it up in plastic, but if you can keep the temperature dropped to a really, say, 37 degrees, the plastic will be fine as long as you can pack ice on it because you won't have any bacteria starting, which will occur the uh, epidermis slip. Um, so a plastic bag will be fine if you can pack it with ice and try not to get it too wet. Just keep it cool before you can get it to your taxidermist. A lot of taxidermists will prefer it that way. But if you know the procedure how to salt, or I mean, excuse me, if you know the procedure how to turn the lips, turn the eyes, the ears, the nose, and so on and so forth, then go ahead and just get all your red meat off, get all your fat, 
and salt it as good as you can. Roll it up for a day, let it juice, unroll it, and resalt it. Uh, but a lot of the hunters out there and a lot of sportsmen, they, they are not familiar with that procedure, which is, which is understandable because taxidermists do it every day. You know, you guys are familiar with those animals for just a few moments before you get it down the ground and then you get into skinning. But uh, also, you, it's easier when you start taking your carcass or the hide off the carcass, it's easier to keep the meat on the animal opposed that when you get it all skinned out and you got a half inch, two inches of meat and fat on there, it'll take you a lot longer to pull it off. If you just take your time and just be careful, and everyone's usually careful when they start off, but what happens when they start skinning it, you know, they get tired or it's the end of the day, they get a little sloppy sometimes and they just go ahead and rip it off and then you got all this meat on there. If that's the case, don't salt it because if you salt it, you'll have dried hide, dried meat, dried fat. The taxidermist won't be able to get it off. Uh, then the taxidermist is going to have to send it to a tannery like that. And in your tannery, when they go to rehydrate or soak it up in their solutions, everything else of the hide will be relaxed except for some of those hard spots. And when they run them across their circular knives, you got a hole. And then the taxidermist has to sew it up. And then it's just not a good, you got hair pattern discoloration sometimes, it's just not a really good idea to do that. So if you are not familiar with the procedures, get it off the animal and just get it cooled down, but get it frozen if you can. If you can drive into a, a local town, get it frozen. You can put it in plastic and then get it frozen. Or if you're not going to, if you think you're not going to be able to get it frozen, you can put it in a plastic bag, but long as it's cool, it needs to be cold or cool. Actually cold, not even cool, it should be cold. Like say a drink would be cold or something. Then you can keep it there for a couple more days before you can get it frozen. When you do get a trophy and you feel that it's a trophy in your eyes, it may be a forget horn, it could be a 30 inch buck, it could be you know 90 point antelope, 380 point elk. Uh, you might want to do a little bit of investigating on the taxidermist that you feel that you would want to have your trophy mounted by. Uh, you're better off to do the homework ahead of time before you go hunting because a lot of times when you get the animal, you're in a panic, you're in a rush, you send it to this first tax number, so some guy recommends a guy, well, we'll take it to this guy, we'll take it to that guy because you, you need to get that animal taken care of. So just do your homework like you would on a hunt. You know, you do your homework on your hunt, the areas where you're going to go into, do the same thing on your tax terms. Go in there, talk to guys that have had stuff done, talk to uh, the guys that have had stuff that were happy, people that are unhappy. Um, look at the work, see if they have any type of credentials to back up what they tell you or their ads in the papers or in a phone book. Uh, you know, if they're a, what do I wanna say, a qualified tax have they been to any of these shows, any of these uh, state level shows, any of these national shows, world shows, they'll have ribbons. I'm sure they'll be displaying them in their office or in their showrooms. Uh, you definitely want to look for that stuff. Um, a lot of guys, you'll hear a lot of talk about how good they are, how many schools they've been to, or so on and so forth, but it boils down that you need to do some homework on it because it may result in having that trophy hanging in your den or in your garage. I hope these tips I have shown you will help you put a nicer trophy on your wall. I'm Greg Cole. Until next time, good luck hunting. Hi, my name is Bill Cook. I'm from uh, Sparks, Nevada, and I'm a fish uh, specialist. And I mount uh, a lot of trophy uh, cold water fish and warm water fish, pretty much a little bit of everything. Uh, I've won a lot of uh, awards at state and national and uh, world levels and uh, kind of been around a little bit and I'm going to try to show you the finer points on uh, taking care of a trophy fish, whether it's uh, for a reproduction or a skin mount. Uh, these uh, processes we're going to show you are real simple and uh, they should work out real good and give you a real nice finished uh, product at the end. So we'll go ahead and get right into it. Okay. Uh, after you catch your fish and you land the fish, you want to go ahead and take your uh, photographs as soon as possible before the fish loses any color. Uh, and once you get, uh, get
get to shore and get your fish landed, you're going to end up having to kill the fish because this salt, uh, I mean, it, you don't want to put salt on anything that's living because it's just going to stress it out big time and it's just not a good thing to do. Uh, and it, which it can affect the color pattern in there if the fish gets too stressed. So what, what you want to do after your photographs is you want to uh, stun the fish. I just use a sawed off uh, short end of a broom handle or anything like that. And you want to hit the fish right on the top of the head where the scales in and the top of the head uh, turn smooth. It's just back uh, a little ways behind the eyes, right in this area right here. And if you just hit them, and you want to try to hit them once and hit them hard. Uh, and don't worry about that little area getting damaged. And you'll know when you do it right because almost all the fins are just going to straighten right out and you'll know. Uh, and then just give it a few uh, minutes after that and get into the salting process. And also you can see that this fish, even though it does have an indentation there, this fish hasn't been gutted. Uh, if you're going to ha have your fish mounted, and it is a skin mount, uh, don't ever gut the fish. Don't do anything to it other than salting it and getting it uh, frozen and, and packaged up right. Uh, you just leave the rest of that up to the taxidermist because uh, we do different incisions all over and uh, it just may, it causes a lot of problems. Uh, if you do gut one or, or you already did do it and it's in the freezer and you want it mounted, it can be dealt with. but. Uh, it is a lot of work, so definitely don't gut the fish, don't take out any of the gills or anything like that, and just keep the, the fish in just one whole piece is a really way to go about it. You want to go ahead and lightly salt the fish, just regular good old Morton salt or whatever your store carries, and you just want to lightly sprinkle it. You don't need to, you can't really put too much on, but you don't need to kind of overdo it. So if you just get just a light coat like that. And one area here that you really, I want to point out to you, this is one of the main ones, is right under here under the pectoral fin. Uh, this fish was never salted and you can see what happened right here. All the, it loses all the color in the skin from the fin laying up against there. So you want to make sure and get salt on both sides of that fin. And that will keep that from happening. Uh, that's kind of one of the real bad areas there. So really make sure you get it on both sides. And you can put a little bit up here in the gills and on the head and in the mouth a little bit. And go ahead and turn it over and make, make sure you get both sides here. That looks pretty good. And that should just about do it there. So it's just a real light coating. And basically what that does is the, uh, the salt, uh, when it mixes in with the uh, slime that's on the fish, the uh, pH factor of the fish is real close to what it was in the water, which keeps it from losing color and uh, getting any of these fade spots and uh, picking up any of those light spots where the fins uh, lay up against the body. Or if you set it on your tailgate or something and it has the little lines in it, and you, I'm sure you guys have seen that where that's happened. So this will eliminate all that. And. Uh, I would say really the best thing that this does, it not only helps preserve the fish, but it locks in all the color. So if you take your photograph right away and then put this salt on it after you kill the fish, uh, it will lock all that color in so that when uh, a taxidermist like myself goes to paint it, we're just actually going to tint the fish with color rather than trying to opaque the whole thing out or have to put uh, a lot of white on it to cover up all those mistakes uh, from not salting it. So if you do it that way, uh, we just basically will tent the fish and you'll come out with a real uh, super trophy. And as far as uh, packaging the fish in your freezer, this salt, if you, uh, once you salt it, if you put it in a plastic bag and just keep it out of the sun or in a cooler, it doesn't uh, necessarily have to be frozen. But if you keep it uh, out of the sunlight and uh, fairly cool, it'll last uh, for a few days like that so you don't have to worry about you know, rushing right back to the uh, freezer. You can, this will just help kind of protect the tail. Uh, this is kind of just optional, it's not that big of a deal. Because once this fish is frozen uh, and all the fins are laying up against the body, it, it's pretty hard to hurt it unless it's really thrown around in the freezer quite a bit. But it, I would say the tail is probably the most vulnerable. So you can just cut out a couple quick pieces of cardboard here. And you can just uh, go ahead and set Set this cardboard on either side. Uh, 
and run a couple staples through it. Make sure you don't staple through the tail. Don't get don't get in there too deep, but just on the edge, just a couple of them, just to kind of hold it into place there. Something like that. Now I kind of use these little, these uh, bags here, they're kind of extra heavy duty. So they're a little bit better as far as strength and everything like that. So I'd recommend maybe using the little stronger bag if you can. This particular size you can get just right, get this fish just fits right in the bottom there, just perfect. And you want to make sure your uh, bag is airtight just so you don't get any freezer burn. Normally I'll just go ahead and keep that tail flat and then just roll this up. And you can use pretty much any type of tape, but as long as you get that thing sealed in there, it's pretty good. Uh, it just will keep all that air out of there so you don't have to ever worry about getting any freezer burn. And It'll probably keep that fish good for, I've done them where they've been two years old, but you'd probably like to get it to your taxidermist right away and uh, let him get it into his freezer and everything. But it would be fine, uh, you know, for at least a year or so without any problem. So that should take care of that as far as a skin mount goes. Um, as far as uh, reproduction fish go, if you're thinking of having one uh, done for you, if you want to turn your fish loose or whatever, uh, take a real good uh, photograph of that fish, maybe a few of them since you're not going to be keeping it, and you want to measure the girth and the length of the fish. And uh, write that stuff down so that your taxidermist has it, because if he doesn't have a blank, he can go ahead and get, get a hold of one. And then the uh, photographs, of course, are real valuable as far as getting the color real close to what you remember that you caught. Um, if it is a fish that you acquired or it is a dead fish or the fish died and you're going to give it to the uh, taxidermist to cast off of it, you could probably, uh, I wouldn't recommend salting the fish because it will uh, leave some marks on it and it'll come out in the cast. So it might not be as good of a cast if you do it that way. So I would eliminate it as far as that goes if you're just going to go for a straight reproduction. But on a skin mount, this is a real simple way and it's cheap. Uh, and it'll take care of your fish and give you that much, you know, nicer of a job. This technique here too also will work on any fish, warm water, cold water fish, uh, even salt water fish occasionally, but uh, it will work on any fish so you don't have to worry about using anything else. Well, there you have it. Uh, that's a real cheap and inexpensive way to take care of your uh, trophy fish. And uh, you won't have to worry about any of the problems that we showed you. So go out there and catch as many as you can. <laughs> and good luck fishing. Thank you for watching. We trust that you found this video both informative and interesting. Other titles include everything you'll need to learn to process your meat, poultry, and fish. Process like a pro.